Hi everyone, welcome back to the Unity 4J Vigil. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Voss, an independent journalist, contributor to Consortium News, and I'm honored to have with me uh, Nozomi Hayase, PhD, who is a liberation psychologist, which um, as I was reading earlier, uh, it ties uh, personal uh, mental illness and issues of that nature to uh, the social history and, and co larger cultures, which makes so much sense, Nozomi, for the, in the sense of the writing that you've done on relating to uh, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, and the work of WikiLeaks, which I've read parts of and which have always been really inspiring and amazingly well written. So thank you uh, for joining us. And thank how, how are you? I'm, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Right. So what do you make of the latest developments uh, of the last week or so? I mean, it's, you know, it's something expected. I mean, it, you know, I just started to see what is inevitable. I mean, we know, um, you know, stack things are stacks against him. And so you, it really, for me, it was a very scary moment to recognize that, you know, Ecuadorian government, I mean, the, the Rainy Moreno was, you know, planning to evict him and, and some, you know, Fortunately, WikiLeaks got the information so that they were able to alert us so that we can actually do something about it. Um, but for me, um, the, you know, Chosho Manning's um, subpoena, subpoena to appear um, at the, to testify at the secret grand jury. And now she, you know, she is sent back to jail for refusing to testify at the grand jury. And that, to me, that event really, he, very close, close to me. That that all of a sudden, this this became so real to me because we know that there were there have been secret charges against Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, but it's something abstract in in some ways, you know. And now, when that that secret grand jury is is, you know, moving on, that then it became clear to me that U.S. government is wanting really, you know, they want Assange here and they want to extradite him to, to this country and, and put him into jail. So that was, that all of a sudden uh, became so real. And I, I felt so strongly that I, you know, I need to do something about this. I, I somebody who lives in this country um, and, you know, I, I just cannot watch this to happen. So, um, yeah, and so this recent development really is, what is expected. And I'm so glad that we are able to actually do something about it, yeah. Absolutely, and I think um, that a lot of the guests that, that have been on previously have just mentioned the fact that, that, as you said, the fact that WikiLeaks was able to broadcast the information that they had, and the fact that all the journalists and, and supporters went to the embassy, and the fact of this vigil helps to actually prevent that. So it's not so much a boy who cried wolf scenario, it's much more, you know, the, the fast, rapid response really prevented the worst exactly. happening. Exactly, and, and this is again, uh, the effect of the internet and the effect of new generation of internet. And now we can uh, share information and we can mobilize very quickly and then act, take action. And I think that if Assange was living, you know, back in 60s, for instance, he, he would have been assassinated by now. You know, we know what happened to Martin Luther King. We know what happened to Marco X and, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, all of those people who, spoke truth to power and stood for the oppressed. They were all, you know, subjected to basically state-sponsored assassination. And it all started with character assassination and that escalated into real assassination. So, um, you know, because of the internet and because we now live in a much different environment that we can actually prevent uh, this friend, this tragedy from, you know, being enacted on Julian Assange. So, um, but we still have to fight so strongly and we really have to oppose uh, this government prosecution of Julian Assange. And we have to change this, you know, this narrative that all heroes are destined to, to be killed by, by those in power. And, you know, that's not true. You know, we, we can change the history. And, and this would be maybe the first hero that we have that, that could actually live on and continue to do the work that he had started and, and you know, yeah. No, that's brilliant. And I think I completely agree. And I would add that uh, in addition to his not having been assassinated in the way that, you know, others have been by the same, the same forces, really, uh, I think that it's really interesting that, um, you know, we also can identify those efforts to do that. Whereas maybe in the, before the internet, we maybe supporters of um, 
Gandhi and others who were assassinated would not have been quite as aware of the active attempts to do so. Whereas I think we are in this case, which is another another benefit. But you're writing about about the way in which oh, go ahead. If you have a thought, please, please just go right ahead. <laughs> Everybody is now watching, you know. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah. So this won't happen so easily. I mean, we would not let, let it happen, you know. Yeah. But uh, you're you're writing on specifically about the way that Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange act as human shields and bulwarks against these forces for the benefit of the rest of us is something that really moved me a lot and influenced my writing about this when I was just writing reports. Um, can you just uh, for those who haven't read your work, can you? Um, expand on that and, and describe that to the audience because you put it yeah, beautifully think, in your writing. You know, some of the challenges I have, for instance, you know, trying to raise awareness about the situation of Julian Assange is that, um, I mean, because of the, the effectiveness of this Russia gate narrative in, in the United States, that people now see Assange has been effectively demonized. So um, even those who support whistleblowers, those who support Church and Manning, they, I was told that some of them said, I can support, we can support Chelsea Manning, but not Julian Assange. And, you know, and, and we have to separate them. And that Chelsea Manning did it out of her own conscience and Julian has nothing to do with what she did. And that we can, you know, Chelsea Manning is good, but Julian Assange is not good, you know. And that we have to recognize that Chelsea would not have been able to do what she has done uh, without WikiLeaks, without college of Julian Assange. And, and in fact, that, you know, Julian Assad, what Julian Assad has done is, is help American citizens, you know, ordinary American people like Manning to act out of conscience and fulfill the gap between ideals in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So those of us who live in America and, and Americans, we tend to think that the Constitution is perfect and that, you know, we have this rhetoric of defending the Constitution or upholding the Constitution. But we have to realize that Constitution wasn't perfect, and the Constitution was meant to be the fulfillment of ideals in the Declaration of Independence, and we tend to forget these ideals. And then these ideals that, that were written by Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers, clearly stated, all men are created equal. But we still have this reality that, you know, the application of law, equal application of law, has not been made possible. So, and it has been you know, seen throughout US history, starting from, you know, women didn't have right to vote and African American didn't have their own civil, civil rights. Uh, students, you know, during the free speech movement, they were not allowed to have free speech, allowed to exercise free speech on campus. And we fought for these basic rights to realize these ideals in a declaration of independence. So what Julian Assange has done really is that, you know, Julian Assange allow Churchill Manning, Manning to engage in the act of civil disobedience. And the act of civil disobedience, of, of course, that was introduced by American philosopher, Henry David Thoreau. And then it was Gandhi who was inspired by uh, Thoreau's uh, idea, demonstrated, you know, he took and created nonviolent resistance um, in, through the act of civil disobedience. So if you look at it, you know, to, to try to kind of um, create a narrative that Assange is or WikiLeaks is, is trying to subvert American ideals, uh, that's nonsense, you know, that's, that's not true. That the, what WikiLeaks has done, and Julian especially, you know, what he has done is he was trying to fulfill these ideals that American people, you know, our founding fathers so stood and fought for, you know, sacrificed their life for, and trying to help us to fulfill the gap, you know, between um, these ideals and the, the Constitution. So this is a very significant, I think, for American people to recognize, you know, that the, the, their law, I mean, that the wiki, the church of money would not have been able to, to, to have done what she has done without WikiLeaks. And the WikiLeaks, of course, has not been able to publish material without church of money. And then, in fact, you know, church of money actually first went to New York Times and the Washington Post, bringing the, the information that was revealed by WikiLeaks, for instance, the Corrado Mata video. And, and the, the New York Times journalists, you know, were looking at, I mean, the, 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 the image, you know, visceral image of U.S. Army, um, you know, the killing um, uh, innocent civilians, including journalists, including Reuters journalists, you know, they turned their back 
you know, away from them and, and you know, dismissed uh, Manning's, um, uh, you know, request. So, and, and, you know, it was really the WikiLeaks has become the, the, the publisher of Manning's last resort. And, and so, so that's why, you know, the, and, and then she went to WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks kind of just republished that. And, and not only WikiLeaks published this, WikiLeaks protected the source. You know, the WikiLeaks had 100% record of uh, source protection and even protecting, um, you know, the, the somebody else sources like Edward Snowden. You know, it was Sarah Harris and the WikiLeaks and working in, in you know, with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, were able to help uh, uh, Snowden to uh, have uh, obtain safe passage, right? I mean, so if you think about it, it's it's WikiLeaks not only is good at uh, have a college in publishing uh, um, material that that is of a public interest, but they also helped and protected the source. So you know if you look at what this organization has done, this organization has done uh, uh, a tremendous. Uh, you know, made a tremendous contribution to to our democracy, uh, and, and and especially, you know, for American audience, you know, that that Julian Assange has defended American American ideals. I have never seen, including maybe founding fathers, including founding fathers, I have never seen that much courage and integrity as as Assange demonstrated to defend these American values that at the same time universal. You know, so. Um, I think that's a very important thing for people to understand. So we have to treat them. We have to show support for everybody who defends um, these universal ideals. And, and, you know, we cannot just say, hey, I support uh, a Chelsea, but not Julia. No, you know, if you support Chelsea, you also have to understand uh, Julian Assange's pride for freedom and support him as well. And if you support Julian, of course, you know, you also have to support Chelsea. So it's, you know, we all have to have support for those brave people. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I think that it's sad that um, in addition to the, the description you, you just gave of the way in which some say, oh, we'll support Chelsea, but not Julian. I've also seen, especially mm -hmm. on my Twitter feed for some reason, um, I've seen a lot of conservative people uh, basically say, I will support Julian and, and WikiLeaks, but I won't support Chelsea. And how dare you uh, ask me to support her? And, you know, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll basically say, you know, they'll, you know, ha take issue with the whole transgender issue and all of that, which I find horrendous mm -hmm. and, and absurd. If you actually support WikiLeaks, then that is one of the, you know, what Chelsea Manning contributed was one of the most, obviously the most massive uh, pr uh, publications they ever released. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just saying that I have seen the opposite of what of that example, and it's horrendous. But, right. but yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I think you really hit the nail on the head about in in describing what what Julian Assange has done and WikiLeaks has done as the fulfillment of the founding fathers and the ideals on which America was kind of founded. But uh, could you? Uh, describe and uh, the description of the New York Times journalists and others. I, I don't know how many outlets uh, Chelsea Manning went to when she uh, first attempted to have her leaks published, but mm -hmm. I know that it was a number of them and they all turned away. Now, that is such an incredible statement about the way in which journalists will turn their back, as you said, on other journalists. Um, do you think that that's the, whatever whatever is motivating that do you think that's the same reason that these journalists, at the, just like they turned on the collateral murder video, that they're turning now on Julian Assange? Um, well, I, you, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think one of the important things that WikiLeaks has done um, on top of you know, releasing materials that is of a critical of democracy is that it revealed the state of modern media and then what you know, basically journalists have become. And, and journalists are elevated into uh, into a professional class and that their job in this, you know, first of all, we have to recognize that we don't have democracy. We have managed a democracy and that was quite intended and it was uh, carefully crafted. And, and so, so for instance, that there was uh, um, Edward Bernays, uh, father of, of public relations who created propaganda. He had this plan, he had this idea that we have to have a managed democracy and in order to do this, we have to somehow control uh, engineer public public um, co consent and and through using the psychological basically um, uh, manipulation right and and uh, to to engineer consent 
that the people who are inside this democracy think that they are free and they are making their own independent decisions, but actually they are being manipulated. The whole process has been manipulated. Um, and so, so we start from this fact that the, we have lived in a managed democracy, we don't live in a, in a democracy. And then what is the role of the media? What is the role of journalists in this? And then they become gatekeepers, they become, their job is to basically control information control that flow of information. And they do actually two ways, two important ways. One is through secrecy. So we have massive overclassification of government documents. So the documents that are made public, may, should be made public, are classified for no reason, basically. So that's one of the government's secrecy. And the government, by using secrecy, they control, um, uh, you know, they basically hide their real actions behind this facade of democracy. And then, and then they also um, uh, engage in manipulation. So it's, it goes with two steps. So that if information is released or um, if, if, you know, some, some, yeah, then they will engage in manipulation. And then they, journalists to carefully do this, they redact information, they censor information, they um, withhold certain information uh, without telling us why they did this and without giving us any uh, means for, uh, to check their validity, their assertion, so that editors of, of these large institutions, media organizations, they could basically say, I redacted, I withhold this information because this would harm uh, US national security. But we, on the receiving end of this news, don't have any means to validate their, their claim. And then WikiLeaks basically revealed by releasing us all who archives and giving us, you know, they, they create a scientific journalism. And what they do is that um, they uh, give us all the information so that we can actually uh, engage in checks and the balance of power and checks and the balance of, of, of these journalists. So, you know, in this managed democracy, the one of the, of course, um, the mechanism to maintain the integrity of this system is uh, this, uh, um, this basic notion of a checks and the balance of power, right? So that, that we were told, we are made to believe that our job as citizens is to uh, hold uh, uh, elected officials accountable. Right, so that was the one of the important aspect that we were at least taught to believe, and but the, in this there was all, all, of course flaws in this system because we don't have any means to account for journalists, right? So we have to just believe in what journalists say or th what they report on. Um, so and then and the, the free press have been effectively compromised so that they became stenographer to power. So then, what, then this create this enabled this managed democracy without any raising any suspicion among us, among people. Um, so what WikiLeaks has done is WikiLeaks, you know, dismantled this operation, made us see what it is about. And and and, and the the first part is is you know to to show us that how uh, journalists have become a, a professional class, and then and as a professional class, they have no interest. They don't share interests with public. You know, they are divorced from the interests of ordinary people. And they are paid, to, you know, they are professional, they are paid for this. So, so they have really, uh, in the first place, uh, no interest in, in caring about us or defending our interests. Um, so, so, and then it's their job. And they're, they, if that's their job, they're actually doing great, great job, good job, right? Because they have been effectively deceiving us. And, and you know, censoring and controlling information and hiding and allowing the government secrecy to go on. And they did a massively great job on that, right? And, and, but then the question the WikiLeaks raised is, what is the function of free press? What, you know, what should we, you know, what should we journalists uh, do? You know, what, what is our law if we were to truly create democracy, you know? So then, uh, of course, the, what WikiLeaks has done is, is, is organization get us scientific journalism. So now we don't have to depend on these professional class, professional journalists anymore, and we can actually hold them accountable now, right? Absolutely. So that's, that's, I think, a very important part uh, we have to realize. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, and now it's the Guardian engaged in this publication of you know, Paul Manafort uh, uh, meeting, meeting Julian Assange and things like that. I mean, all of those things now, it, it's, it's just become so clear 
Like they are, they are just the. It's become so clear that the, they, they, what they are, they are really um, a professional class, and they are gatekeeper, and they are, um, you know, and and Assange is different than them in that regard because he is a true journalist. He enables the true function of free press, and by enabling true function of free press, he enabled democracy, the real democracy we never had. So that is a threat. That is a threat to their business model, their business model as you know, the journalism as a professional class who are handsomely paid, financially rewarded. You know, that model is gone. They are, they are, you know, the only reason that they could go on is because they still have, you know, money. You know, they, they, they are corrupted with all the corporate money and, and all that stuff. Absolutely. Now, I love the term that you brought up, uh, scientific journalism. And I think that uh, from the way I understand it, it's like re- WikiLeaks really invented that. You know, uh, it's just something that didn't yeah. exist before, as you're saying. And and I love that you've really um, broken down and dismantled the the concept of journalism as far as what the the establishment media does versus what WikiLeaks does. And I was wondering, um, you know, we have uh, Lisa Johnson who came on as well. He's also a psychologist, and she talked about the way in which uh, you know other psychologists have really not only failed to come out and stand for Julian Assange or WikiLeaks, but also have you know, participated in the creation of propaganda, just like you're describing journalists doing. So I wonder if you could just maybe comment on why you think more psychologists aren't doing what you and Lisa have done and, you know, what role maybe the kind of establishment backed or backing journalists um, have in all of this, pro- this mess, this problem. Um, I mean, I'm now trying to, um, I'm trying to push um, this psychologist with a social responsibility. It's a non-profit organization based in uh, Chicago. Um, you know, the, the organizations that are trying to promote justice and peace um, and, you know, with, with knowledge of psychology. So the, the issue of um, Julian Assange and Shoshan Manning, I saw was a perfect um, issue that for them to uh, t- uh, take on. So I'm now proposing, I mean, pushing them to um, sh- uh, show support. Um, and I've been met with uh, challenges, of, of course, and I initially um, tried to uh, approach the organization because I'm a member of this organization. Um, and I approached this organization first in 2016, right after uh, UN um, concluded that uh, Julian Assange's uh, situation is, is an arbitrary, arbitrary detention. Um, and you know, when that ruling came, it was a great opportunity to push that you know, narrative and, and uh, really you know, raise an uh, issue about Julian Assange's right for freedom. And at that time, I was, um, I, it, my proposal didn't go anywhere because of the, the many members uh, believed in this, you know, accusation, uh, Julian's accusation, uh, the alleged misconduct in Sweden. Um, and so some of them perceived him as a rapist and, you know, they, many of them really um, were effectively, um, um, you know, um, in informed about um, his situation. Um, and now I'm meeting, um, the challenge that I'm have, having is, is that many of them believed in Russia Gates. So, um, and I approached them right after the, the Mueller report uh, came out, basically concluding there's no collusion between Trump administration and the Russia. Um, so I thought that was a great opportunity again to push forward, you know, the, 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 um, and, but then they wanted to have a full uh, report, mutual report uh, for them to make a decision about this. And, and, and um, they, they were very wary about uh, showing support for Julian when there is this, you know, the, the government and the mainstream media kind of portray, um, uh, trying to link um, Assange with Russia and, and also this narrative that Julian a- um, aided, um, you know, the victory of um, uh, Trump candidacy. Um, and it was kind of a, I'm, I, I, I was crafting this, um, basically the write up, uh, to explain, you know, point by point, you know, regarding Assange's, um, preliminary investigation in Sweden and then going into the Russia gate and, you know, debunking some of the myths that surrounding uh, Russia gate. And it's kind of a, you know, turned into eight page, eight page long, um, huge article. And when I was writing this, I got, very frustrated and to the point that I was really mad, you know, and yeah, I'm, I'm rightly. A person. I don't, I don't get mad usually, but I was so mad writing because 
the amount of smearing and the character assassination that Assange have been subjected to, and then you have to step by step, you know, this is not right, this is not correct, this is the fact, this is the fact, then anyone who look at this would raise a question, I would think, that why, what has this person done, right? I mean, to, to deserve this much um, uh, smearing. I mean, it's, 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 if this is really about uh, his sexual misconduct, Okay, how could this person, I mean, I mean, I never heard any situation where even somebody who committed a serious crime would not be subjected to this, right? So it's, it's but then it, I, I learned that in some ways I'm learning lesson as to how, how important it is to know the only audience when I speak. So, and then, and, and understand where they are coming from and uh, try to, um, you know, trying to craft a narrative uh, to speak to them, and and one of the the you know the, the aspect that I that I find is that the people really are deeply involved in identity politics. So that it's it's you know the Assange issue. Um, this triggers uh, the deep core of of their identity. You know what what makes them uh, basically who they are, and and some of them identify themselves as as. Um, Democratic Party uh, connected to Democratic Party. Some some of them identify themselves as socialists, for instance, um, and fighting against you know by fighting against Trump uh, and fighting against capitalism, uh, they derive their meaning, they derive their identity. So if, if you bring up um, uh, something that you know the, the, that really does provoke this narrative that you know Julian or it's connect somehow connected to Trump or, you know, or undermine the democratic establishment or whatever. I mean, that, that would really um, uh, trigger um, emotional reaction and the resistance that would be met with resistance. And, and as we know that we are not just driven by um, uh, logics and reason and, and all those rational, you know, our decisions are made by unconscious desires and, and something that is actually rather irrational. And that's why, you know, even if you present fact that they cannot actually, we cannot process these facts. As soon as we are emotionally um, uh, disturbed and, and charged, you know, then these facts cannot ever register to our mind. So, you know, it's kind of important. I mean, what I kind of now shifted is uh, for that particular group of people, um, I, I wanted to basically speak to them, ask a question. So, um, you know, let's you know, let's not even talk about Russia again at this point, okay? And and then then um, the the fact that the material that was uh, released or handed over by uh, Lucifer 2.0, which United States governments, um, you know, which U.S. government uh, said that it's it's related to Russia hack basically, and that material was published by other media um, outlets such as Intercept, the Washington Post. Um, you know, dozens of other media organizations. So why do you single out WikiLeaks? You know, so you are saying then, you know, nobody should have published the information. Uh, that is obviously, it's very important uh, for us to know. Um, and so, you know, if, if we allow the Trump administration to uh, prosecute Julian Assange, you know, extradite him to, to the United States, then who's next? You know, exactly. it could be New York Times, could be Washington Post, but could be other media organizations. And um, so then they would understand that they, they immediately start to recognize that, that this is the dangerous precedent to be made. And we have to oppose this um, because what concerns is, is uh, you know, our really what, what he, Trump administration poses a threat to democracy um, that we all cherish. So. You know, so then we we shouldn't be talking about Russia Gate and all of that stuff. You know, at this point, we should be concerned about our democracy. We should be concerned about whether we are going to have a free press or not. That's that's our main issue at this point. And and let's talk about Russia Gate later. You know, let's not wait until the media report will be fully released. Uh, we don't have much time. You know, at the same time, you know, while we are waiting, um, uh, we the, the things are moving forward very quickly and. And also I heard that this, um, um, you know, people say, we want to be neutral. You know, we don't know yet. We don't have enough fact to, to, 
to say that the Union has not been engaged in any kind of, um, you know, Russia hack or supported Trump or any of that. We, we don't know enough fact about this. So I'm going to wait. And then once these facts are presented to me, then I understand, then I can make a decision. And then until then, I want to be neutral. I mean, that's the, another thing that I hear often. But, you know, as Howard Zinn, the historian Howard Zinn once said, we cannot be neutral in a moving train. And that the being neutral, you are actually supporting, you are becoming complicit in this government oppression. So, you know, we have to recognize, you know, we are making stance either not by not doing anything or remaining silent or actually uh, deciding to stand up for, for this issue. So let's not, let's you know, you know, stop pretend that uh, we can be ever neutral, you know, and that's a very important point. And another thing that maybe relate to neutrality is the main, I mean, the journalist uh, profession's creed of objectivity. That's another thing that, that WikiLeaks effectively challenged. And um, one of the things that this modern journalism and then, you know, journalists as a professional class um, maintain its power, you know, the power to construct narrative, basically power to create a narrative and with that power to construct a reality for all of us. And they had, they were given enormous power, you know, a huge amount of power to do this. And then they were able to maintain this power by the use of the creed of objectivity. And that creed of objectivity is simple. You know, it's actually nothing objective at all because they would magically hide their motives and subjective agendas with the, with the claim that they are objective, you know? And you know, we know once we actually have full documents, we realize how subjective it is, how subjective it is for an editor to decide what to withhold information, what information to withhold and what to be released, and for them to decide what is of public interest, what document is, is have significance uh, of, of, for democracy. I mean, they are making these subjective agenda, I mean, subjective decisions. Um, and then yet they, you know, hide this decision making process uh, uh, with this simple pretense of objectivity. Um, then nobody, nobody can uh, challenge the objectivity. And WikiLeaks uh, basically by giving means for ordinary people to challenge the objectivity. And then we now realize that we cannot be able objective and then the, this profession's creed of objectivity is a farce. You know, all we have is, we have a creed of transparency. That's what uh, WikiLeaks has brought. And, you know, and with the creed of objectivity, we can actually attain objectivity because the, the real source, primary source, provide objective, um, objective data. You know, that's all about it. You know, there's, you know, there's no manipulation and control involved. We can see um, all information as, as it is. Um, and, and one of the damage that this creed of objectivity has done really is uh, it's basically deprived our ability to um, uh, seek for moral clarity because under this creed of objectivity, uh, researchers and journalists, they are prevented from um, making moral assertion, taking a stance in matters. And then once, you know, journalists voice um, their, their uh, support for uh, another journalist like Julian or um, certain kind of issues that, that relate to the um, oppression of certain population, you are seen as not a journalist. You are seen as you, you didn't um, exercise, you know, creative objectivity, you become subjective. Um, and then, you know, we cannot ever en engage ourselves with um, our passion and the passion for justice and morality. So. And that's, this created uh, this, this huge damage uh, to our society that not only um, you know, eliminated um, uh, morality from uh, modern journalism, but morality from uh, society at large. And WikiLeaks you know, brought that space, you know, uh, made it possible for us to actually connect with our own morality and, and for us to say, uh, I make a decision, you know, out of my own uh, knowledge, you know, what is, which side is the right side of history. And it's obvious to me that, you know, uh, siding with um, whistleblowers and, and WikiLeaks uh, supporting and defending Julian Assange is definitely on the right side of history. And, and you know, and the history is now being made and we, ha we are taking part in this, whether we know or not, right? So, um, and we, are, you know, again, the one of the things that WikiLeaks has done is helping ordinary people to claim 
our own history that we have become objects, you know, being tossed around and made to carry a script that are handed down to us. And especially those of us who are not grown up in the Western parts of society, uh, the, you know, people uh, whose um, money revealed, uh, you know, how they became treated like animals, you know, that's what we have seen in the, the you know, low age of, of uh, US army strikes uh, on the street of New Baghdad. Um, that has been taking place in 2007. That's what we have seen that these people, Iraqi people, innocent civilians, they were treated like animals, worse than animals. And there's no consequence of killing uh, these innocent people. Uh, these uh, military, you know, they, they, they are able to kill them and, 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 and just present it as collateral damage. Um, and so that's it, you know, that's, it's, it's, you know, WikiLeaks help us to recognize that we are the authors of history. We are not an object to being tossed around and we can find our own place in history. Um, and so, so it has a significance. I mean, it, it, it's, it's I, I think that what WikiLeaks has done is, is just tremendous. It's, it's really intervened in the course of Western civilization and opened up dialogue that we never had, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, uh, going back to one of those topics you were talking about a little earlier, where you said that you know you were writing that 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 paper. I don't know if you ever finished it, and if you would ever consider publishing something like that. I, I did. I did. I did. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Because yeah, that would be definitely the thing for lots of viewers to share with their friends yeah, and relatives. I, I gave them um, link to um, you know the WikiLeaks defense. Uh, you know they right they, right, and, and then again the accusation is. You are too sympathetic um, to to WikiLeaks, and how can I how can I believe what they created, the documents they created? Exactly. You know, it's like right. So you have to kind of translate what they did and and speak your with your own language. Um, I found it to be helpful. Otherwise, it's it's you know you are just branded as just sympathetic supporter. You well, know? and it's interesting though if you were to say that back to them and to say well. Your your rage at Julian Assange has been your emotions have been manipulated to say that's that those emotions towards him are evidence of you being propagandized. I'm sure, especially psychologists, would not be friendly to that to that exactly. statement. I mean, yeah, it's hard to, yeah, so but they, that's they the are, truth. Exactly, and they are also invested in. Um, yeah, you know, their identity is wrapped up with the Democratic Party. So, um, right, you know, yeah. So it, that's harder for them to recognize. I mean, as soon as I shift. The narrative and focus on Trump and basically say, you know, we have to oppose what Trump administration is doing. Then they're they're more willing to listen because then right. for them it's the, the Trump is the enemy, not the Democratic Party. Um, so, you know, yeah. So what Democratic Party did, you know, that they are the one who created uh, this Russia Gate hype. Uh, that it's a liberal media. In, 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 I mean, liberal media. You know, like Rachel Maddow. See, they are the one who, you know, basically disseminated and created this hype of Russia gate, um, and and you know, Trump is also using it as a witch hunt. You know that I'm, you know, Trump is saying I'm, you know, that this whole witch hunt against me by this Democratic Party, right? So I could see why that some people, you know, have a hard time. I mean, Democrat or progressive have a hard time. Um, really accepting the how the Russia Gate was uh, publication, you know, this whole thing was publication. So, you know, that one 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 person uh, challenged my assertion that um, Russia Gate was a complete fabrication, um, and um, you know, he basically said that we don't know that yet, and until the Mueller report is released, we don't know if it was fabricated or not. But to me, it's okay. The fact that there's no evidence that back up the claim, nothing, right? And if, if somebody can create a narrative without any evidence, that to me is a definition of fabrication. Exactly. You know, exactly. That's well, I mean. And now a lot of those same people, because I had the same comments, you know, on social media and you know, in circles that I frequent. And now those same people, now that the Mueller report has the at least the major conclusions of it have been announced, now they've moved the goalpost to well when we see the full report. Exactly. You know, so it's like it never ends. There's no, it's not based on logic, and there's no logical end to it. So it's really difficult, yeah. as you're saying. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. And then they do not challenge the um, claim of these mainstream media. I mean, if you look at Rachel Maddow, I mean, she was basically 
you know, promoting this story without any evidence to begin with. And why do we allow her to basically fabricate this Russia gay and then would not, without even raising any question and then criticizing her? And then why at the same time, you know, when I say, hey, that the Russia gate is not backed by any evidence, then why would that be, you know what I mean? So that, yeah. That, yeah. Like, well, so my question, people, yeah. To, to you, my question would be, you know, these are your colleagues and, you know, there are lots of very well-educated people who are exactly as you describe as far as their thinking process about Russia gate. They're totally taken in by it. How is it that they lack the critical thinking skills to not see through that? And what do you think can be done as well to kind of encourage those critical thinking skills to develop among highly educated people who should know better, you know? Well, that's, well, you know, I mean, I engaged in um, Ralph Nader's uh, presidential uh, campaign um, back in, I mean, when he ran for presidency a couple of times. And I don't know if you're familiar with Ralph Nader. He's a consumer advocate. Um, he, you know, he, he ran for, um, as an independent and the Green Green Party candidate, and and he, he was well respected attorney. Uh, he was considered to be a, a crusader for justice, and the people really looked up to him. Um, but then, as soon as Nader moved into electoral arena, that his image got tainted. He was smeared, and then he basically became. Uh, I mean, he was demonized, and he became a spoiler. So he was labeled right. a spoiler. You know how come? You know he caused the Bush presidency basically, and if he didn't run then Democrat would have won. So that was the narrative. Right. Um, and, and then I watched the, how the Democratic Party uh, attacked Nader and, and engaged in the obstruction of his ballot access, for instance. And then th th that they engaged in bigotry. They called Nader as, you know, as if he has no constitutional right to run for presidency. You know, we all have right to run for presidency. And, and you know, at the same time, the Democratic Party is saying, don't run Nader you are basically ruining this and then you, you demonizing this. So I watched the whole process, how the, the, this basically the, the person who was regarded as a hero by Americans over time, just effectively being smeared and it turned into somebody completely different. And in this, you know, many of the psychologists and my professors, they, fall into this, the whole uh, Dem Democratic Party smearing of Ralph Nader. And, um, you know, so I can understand why psychologists or people who are educated, who are supposed to, to know all of those mechanisms fall into this. Uh, it, it's, and, and at that time, I actually wrote an article um, uh, trying to describe what's going on um, surrounding Nader's, uh, Ralph Nader's uh, phenomena is it's that, it's basically something related to cultural complex, cultural complex of American psyche. And then we have this notion, uh, the Jungian psych psych psychology, uh, the, the understanding of the unconscious. And then it's kind of, we share the emotional, um, the certain kind of um, the, you know, the group consciousness, so to speak. Um, and, right. and when and that forms our identity and once their, our identity threatens, then, um, we fight back basically. And um, so then Nader is basically became a symbol that could threaten that cultural identity and then really stares, the triggers the cultural complex. And that the cultural complex at, at that time, um, how I analyze is that Nader brings out conscience of American people. Because the, the, if when Nader speaks out about issues that Democratic Party were uh, failing to pick up, it really revealed what Democratic Party was, right? The Democratic Party uh, and candidate who, who uh, pretended, present themselves to be fighting for working class and fighting, fighting for justice and all of that stuff. They, they, when it was compared by Nader's real rhetoric and, and actions, it, it became clear. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, and then the, the, those who support Democratic Party, it became clear that they were basically fake progressives. They, they, they are not really real progressives right. who really care for, um, you know, to, to fight for press and for the press and things like that. So then that creates a certain kind of cultural complex because then it, it, the conscience is, is difficult to, right? Uh, when the, you know, it's like a native present a mirror of conscience and they yeah, say, like hey, a mirror. Yeah. Um, you're fake, basically, right? You're, you're fake. Then it's harder for people to face that.
and, yeah, uh, and Assange does the same thing and WikiLeaks does exactly oh, yeah. that yeah to, on a larger scale for sure exactly yes. and and um and and another comment I I um on the question um uh, that I had I got from one of the psychologists um is that why do we have to um bring our attention to Assange's situation and and you know, he depicted um, his, situa he, his situation as he's a, like celebrity status. You know, he's he's um, you know kind of famous, and you know, and uh, um, and why do we have to raise? I mean, bring issue? I mean, attention to to him when there are so many other African Americans, you know, who are unjustly incarcerated? Why don't we support them? And to me, it's it's. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, it, the, what Julian has done. I think you know he he, he had he, Julian has uh, was born into the privileged position as a white male, of course, and he has intelligence and and talent and skills. But what he did was that he used that skill and talent in order to help the oppressed, and he took real risk and he he made real sacrifice, uh, which is not many white people you know with that privilege have done. You know, and 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 many people engaged in you know campaign to to help oppressed or you know the the end the racism and all of that stuff. But they do not. Many of them don't really fundamentally challenge the structure that this systemic racism or systemic oppression that this very fabric of society that creates the perpetuate these um, oppression. They don't do it. They 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 you know they just try to change this, uh, issues here and there. But when um, somebody trying to change the whole system that would threaten their privilege that 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 would lead to them giving up their privilege then many of us actually shy away from actually taking action and julian kind of just the actually took action to make changes um so you know i i for me that makes him very you know is different than other people you know that, that that's why for me in my eyes he's uh, similar to Martin Luther King, Marco my ex, uh, Nelson Mandela, and Mahatma Gandhi, because they are these people actually took personal risk and they challenged uh, this this uh, systemic oppression, not just the certain working on the certain issues, not just doing the campaign here and there or engaged in this uh, uh, presidential election and then once that's over, then they go back to the you know they didn't do that. They actually engaged in in really transforming the society. So, um, yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's, I, I just want to add and like expand on that a little bit um, just to reflect back uh, an example of that I was on a podcast earlier and I had a similar question come up kind of about that. And one of the things that I think even as somebody who's participating in this vigil and who does support Julia Assange and WikiLeaks, it's mind blowing to consider the way in which even we, uh, you know, we um, have our work or our activism, but we, you know, have a personal life. We, we turn off the computer or we go home from work and we have that aspect of life, which everyone has a right to have that should have. But Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning, both, they gave up all of that for, for what they felt was morally correct. And, and as you say, to change the system. And I think that's one of the things that maybe uh, some people just don't understand is the level that they chose to sacrifice, that they like and that's where they do live up to that comparison that you're making that those people like martin luther king and gandhi they also did made that same massive sacrifice and yeah exactly and, yeah. And, yeah and one of the things i found is um you know i'm just almost thinking instead of approaching people who are politically engaged because what's happening is that we have dirty politics you know that the politics got so dirty that that drove people away so the people who should be engaged in politics they are checked out they are not interested in um and and then those who are kind of interested in it still they are effectively um captured by this two-party system and this mainstream propaganda so that they are actually um you know progressive and then they actually have uh, really bought into this um, smear campaign and uh, have a um, negative view of Julian Assange. And it's, it's, I find that it's extremely difficult to counter the narrative that they bought in. And um, so I was thinking maybe we should also, along, you know, as, on top of, of course, continuing to talk to um, these people and inform people who are politically engaged, but also we, we, we want to maybe engage people who are not involved in politics. And, and I was thinking about um, maybe spiritual communities. That's, um, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with um, AMA, 
who is an Indian saint, uh, known as a uh, hugging saint. Yes, I, I am familiar saint. with her. Yeah. yeah. So Anna, for instance, she um, hugged uh, over 34 million people. And she was, in 2012, she was given the um, uh, Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King Award for nonviolence, for her act of nonviolence. And then I think that there is a, I can, you know, we can make a good argument that what Julian Assange uh, with his work with WikiLeaks has done is really, you know, um, continuing on this Gandhi's uh, act of nonviolence and uh, Martin Luther King's work. Um, and in some ways, so there is so much some things in common between Ama and Julian, right? And, and, and if you think about the fact that Ama was able to embrace um, 34 million people and everybody who were given embrace by Ama, if they, you know, find out about Julian and um, show support, I mean, that's a tremendous, you know, huge uh, uh, people. And, and, you know, I was thinking maybe Ama could go to um, Ecuadorian embassy and then give, give Julian Assange a hug. And, and then that would be broadcasted and, you know, we could, you know, the press release and all of that. Then the other devotees, I mean, would be interested in, you know, finding out about who is this guy, who is this Julian Assange, you know, and that would be a massive, you know, campaign to raise awareness for his issue. And then if every one of us uh, take action, trying to do something, I mean, that, that would be, I think, huge. No, no question at all. And actually, um, I think it was uh, uh, another guest mentioned, well, why are there any, you know, spiritual leaders that we could get involved in this? And that's a great, that's a great idea. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think that would really be something to think about. And I think as well, um, you know, just returning to what you said about um, just the way in which, um, you know, people like Edward Bernays kind of created, created propaganda. And that's exactly what journalism has done. Um, you know, could you describe, um, maybe just um, expand on some of the thoughts that you have about um, Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange, and also specifically um, the way in which the Ecuadorian government is treating Assange now. For example, the fact that uh, Lenin Moreno um, was, when he was elected, all of us, uh, all of we WikiLeaks supporters were celebrating because he was going to be the, the president of Ecuador that would be so, uh, following in, in uh, Rafael Correa's footsteps and support Assange, right? And so uh, obviously that didn't happen and a very, a very um, you know, different situation developed after that. But I don't know if you just have any thoughts specifically on the situation now, um, as far as Ecuador's attitude towards Julian and the way that it's it's worsened his conditions in, in the embassy over the last year. Um, I mean, I, I think that overall Julian Assange's situation, I mean, the, his pride for freedom really revealed the complete corruption of, um, you know, the system of representation. And um, this Western government, I mean, UK um, and the United States, um, th they were actually, you know, supposed to be the leading in some ways, leading um, organization, I mean, the leading government actors uh, uh, that would uh, really uh, defend enlightenment values. And it, when UK government refusing to comply with UN ruling, I mean, that, that, that really undermines this whole idea of rule of law. And the United States is, is, you know, the freedom of speech, the First Amendment is US, US tradition. And it's, it's you know, the, one of the important things that the United States brought um, and, and as a concept and, and stood for the world. And, and, and to, to recognize that, that what United States is doing, um, you know, in, in, in their efforts to prosecute Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, I mean, they are destroying its own ideals. Um, and, and, and this, the, what, was, what became clear is, of course, we, we like to think that we moved, moved from uh, this colonial times, the, the, this old colonization, the era of colonization, where strong states could bully and, and invade and, uh, you know, colonize uh, uh, these weak ones, uh, undermine the sovereignty of um, other people and other, other cultures, squashing other cultures. Um, and, you know, we like to think that we have evolved enough as hum humanity uh, to have moved from that kind of, you know, barbaric state. But, you know, what became clear to me is that we actually haven't really moved forward much because what we have is we don't have this outright violence or, you know, the use of force um, to colonize other nations, perhaps, but we are engaged in deception. Uh, that the rule of the game that we have now is deception. Uh, by use of deception, still the strong states uh, um, undermining the sovereignty of um, 
you know, country like you know, South America, country like Ecuador. And so what Ecuador government is doing and, and, you know, Ecuador government is now being able to stand up um, against this U.S. pressure. And then we have to also recognize why is it that the U.S. or U.K. government have so much power over this, this country? Um, and, and, you know, it's one thing to accuse a leader like um, Reni Moreno, but we have to also recognize why is it that this, this president, I mean, basically is, is, is so much pressured like this? And, and, you know, why people in the West, especially uh, seeing this and, and not just stand up um, against uh, this US continuous effort to colonize other, other nations. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 I think it's easier for people to accuse and then criticize um, um, Lenny Moreno, and then I think that he deserved that criticism, of course, for what he's doing. But the, we have a larger issues, and the larger issue is this continuous colonization. And now that became, you know, visible for all of us that we cannot pretend that we now live in the post-colonial era. We are continuing on this colonization. It's just the method uh, uh, different now, and uh, it, it has been difficult for us to see it because it was hidden and it was carried out. In an invisible way, and it was, you know, through financial pressure, um, and it, you know, the Daniel Moreno now um, is it, because of this IMF um, loans and that uh, the country is subjected to, um, and in order to basically, you know, cancel that debt um, that, that, that this country is, is is subjected to this massive pressure by the U.S., then we have to realize why. Why on the earth does the United States government have so much power over the politics of other countries? Why do they in, in, interfere with the, the, the democratic process of other countries? Um, through economic means uh, like financial, um, you know, um, ex, ex, explo exploitation and colonization or military, you know, uh, threat. I mean, so, you know, we need to also sit back and then recognize and, and work with people, ordinary people, um, of Ecuador um, and, and connect, because it's it, what's happening to Julian Assange is our struggle, like it, everybody's struggle, and, and the, the struggle of Ecuadorian citizens, that their, uh, their you know, efforts to claim their sovereignty, their efforts to uh, claim you know, their right to, to exist, and their right to be independent, and right not to be bullied, right not to you know, be tossed around by the, the strong states. So, you know, I, I think that we have to, we have to, you know, basically realize that this is involves a much, much bigger issue and, and really the, the fundamental problems that we face um, as a humanity and, and that this, um, yeah, continue, continuation of colonization. Uh, extremely well put, incredibly well put. Thank you so much uh, for speaking with us today and taking the time. Mm -hmm.